Greece. Welcome to the podcast, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. For over a millennium after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, the ancient societies of Greece and Rome were held up as ideals that Western Europeans would never be able to reach, ideals of you know, political power and military conquest, and even of rhetoric and Latin style and urban civilization and wealth and prosperity. It was, in fact, not until the 18th century when some European thinkers began to argue that the nation-states and empires of Western Europe had it attained a level of prosperity and power, of demography and economic growth that had just surpassed that of the ancient Roman Empire. And then very quickly, the forces of industrialization put that debate to rest. Modernity had surpassed antiquity in terms of economic production, urban density, and so forth. The question remained open in some circles about whose philosophies were better, you know, who had a better understanding of virtue, and so on. But on the economic level, the debate was settled. Subsequently, and especially in the 20th century, scholars began to look more rigorously at the ancient economy and ancient levels of consumption and production. And generally, their findings are what we might call rather grim. So the dominant tendency was to believe that the vast majority of people in the Roman Empire barely got by that they produced the minimum that they needed in order to survive, and that many of them were hovering at that level of tenuous subsistence. And pretty soon, comparative models from the developing world, what used to be called the third world in the 20th century, began to be used, suggesting that antiquity, far from being you know, this high point um, of human prosperity and flourishing, uh, was in fact comparable to, you know, the, the most problematic modern economies, um, full of poverty and misery for the majority of people who lived in them. And yes, there was all this surplus production, which we can clearly see in the form of all these you know, monuments that have survived and urban amenities, and even in the vast trash heaps that the Roman Empire produced, especially like outside of Rome, um, but the, the model that explained that was usually one of exploitation. There's a, a small minority um, that was very, very wealthy and powerful that exploited the majority of the population, appropriated its resources, and produced all of the things that later Western Europeans admired, from the literature to, to the theaters. Now, there are reasons for thinking that antiquity was like this, or parts of it were, or that it was like that at some times. The goal here is not to dismiss that picture. However, there is still no doubt that the Roman Empire at its peak produced more uh, across the board at all social levels than did most of its successor societies, uh, exception being parts of the uh, caliphate. Moreover, there seems to be, to me at least, a bias in the scholarship that favors the more cynical and grim and skeptical approaches to the ancient economy. And in part, this has to do with the dynamic um, of studying classical Greece and Rome. Why? Well, those aren't like ordinary societies in the constellation of so the modern understanding of the past because they were so heavily idealized, because every time we engage with Greece and Rome, we are vulnerable to idealize them and even to treat them as models for our own politics and anything, philosophy, you know, economics, whatever. And yes, this does still happen in many publications. It has also become sort of safer for scholarly reputations to be cynical and grim <laughs> in discussing them in, you know, like hard-nosed economic terms. Like you don't want to be accused of being sort of starry-eyed, uh, 
and taken in by the classical mirage and all of this stuff and focusing on you know hardship and poverty and subsistence and exploitation are definitely a shield against that but in the end always the question should be what does the evidence tell us you know, how are we reading the sources are our models appropriate exactly how much did common people, the 90% of the population, produce and how much did they consume? So I don't think that we're quite at a place where we can address these questions from the ground up in the case of Byzantium. Though for the Roman Empire, the question is becoming increasingly more interesting. And because I wanted to dedicate a number of episodes to questions of wealth, um, and next, our next episode is going to focus on that issue too, but in an early Byzantine Christian context, I seized on the wonderful opportunity of inviting Kim Bowes uh, to the podcast, who is our guest today, uh, who's doing wonderful work uh, along these lines when it comes to the ancient Roman economy. Kim Bowes is a professor of classical studies at the University of Pennsylvania, and she is ideally positioned to help us think through these issues. She wears many hats, so she is an archaeologist who has excavated in Italy primarily. She's also a cultural historian of the Roman Empire and the later Roman Empire, um, having written books on domestic life, household religion, religious change more generally in late antiquity. And she's also focused on economic production. She has co-directed the Roman Peasant Project, and is preparing a study of getting by in the Roman Empire. So I was thrilled to have her on here, and the discussion that we have, I think, will set the stage for subsequent discussions of, of wealth, of who produced what, of who consumed what, and so forth. I should add on an aside here that you know, much of my life has been spent in this anxiety of a question that my father would always pose to me, starting as a child, uh, but I didn't fully realize its significance until later, when he would say, what, he would ask me, like, what exactly have you produced in your lifetime? And compare it to what you have consumed. And for most of my life, of course, there, there was simply no comparison. I had consumed tons more stuff, literally tons, than I had actually produced. I and he would always ask me, well, where does the difference come from? Um, and that's a kind of question that, I've, that I struggle with and have struggled with, and it, it motivates me to learn more about how economies work. Anyway, without any further delay, here's my conversation with Kim Bowes. Also, thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these episodes. Kim, welcome to the podcast. Hey, Anthony. Thank you for having me. So you've done a lot of great work on a number of topics, um, and they all seem to come together into the one that we're talking about today. So you've worked on um, private life, so domestic economy and religion, and material culture, and also archaeology. <laughs> and so those are the kind of threads that are coming together in what we're going to talk about here, right? And your recent projects have been focusing on let's say the majority of the population of the Roman Empire and what, their, what the conditions of their material life were and the strategies that they developed for coping with those. And so you sometimes refer to them as the 90%, the economic 90%. So who do you understand this group of people to be? Who should we picture? Um, this is a great question. I wrestle with who, what to call these people all the time. Um, and I call them a bunch of things. I call them the 90%. I call them working people. Um, basically, who I'm interested in are a set of people who, uh, who exist through the work of their hands. Um, it's a category that doesn't uh, overlap neatly with the categories that we use today. We use blue collar or white collar. Um, we use rich and poor, uh, which the ancient Romans used those categories a lot. None of these really quite get uh, at what I'm talking about. 
what I'm trying to do is get at the vast majority of the population, A, that worked with their hands in order to survive, that is to say, didn't depend on the labor of others exclusively in order to survive. Um, and that is a big basket that includes a lot of different kinds mm. of people. It includes men and women and children, uh, because children worked quite a lot. Maybe we can talk about that in a bit. Um, it includes slaves, enslaved people and free people. Um, and it includes people who do a whole range of different kinds of tasks. These are the people that I'm that I'm really interested in. And so it's a messy category. And the 90%, uh, thank you, David Graeber, uh, who was the anthropologist who um, coined the term in his case, the 99% mm. that was used in the Occupy Wall Street uh, protests. Um, he was, of course, referring to people who don't make their money off the stock market um, and aren't uh, super rich. Um, so I'm slightly uh, copying Graeber's term and modifying it uh, and without necessarily the um, the modern political and economic baggage that's attached to it. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about the using a percentage as a category because that it's come up in modern like American politics, especially quite a bit. And yeah, I was going to ask you about Graeber too. So we have the, the 99% or the, the, the top 1% or, or whatever. Actually, I remember in uh, Mitt Romney's presidential campaign, the number 47% was a, <laughs> a, a lightning rod, right? Like when he said, I think something like 70%, uh, 47% like don't work, don't earn their own, you know, keep by working or they live off of others or something like that. Uh, so yeah, so these numbers can be also become political slogans. Um, but basically, let's say a an, an educated uh, urban uh, resident who writes poems for the senatorial elite. This and and lives fairly well, like like most many of our authors. Th this person would not be in the ninety percent, right? So correct, although of course someone like Marshall and Juvenile do a really good push to try to make it sound as though they're among the 90% and they're starving and they have to run after their patrons and it's very sad. Um, and you know, the work that's been done on some of those folks, uh, we know they own land and they earn money from rents and agricultural surpluses. Um, and so despite their moaning about their poverty, they're probably not as poverty stricken. Um, however, right, the, the thing about the 90% is that it's not a fixed category. And um, maybe many of your listeners will have experienced the ups and downs of um, economic prosperity and its absence. And so um, I can you know we have people that we know about who uh, came and went from the ninety percent? That is to say, mm. they managed to earn enough money to buy land and um, live a life of leisure, and then they lost it. Um, and uh, if anyone's interested in stories about these, the wonderfully hilarious novel, uh, the Satyricon by Petronius, includes a long discussion at a dinner party of these kind of boom bust economics, if you like, of people, mostly freed people who made a pile and then lost their pile uh, or went from essentially having been a slave to a freed person to someone incredibly rich and then um, back to poverty again. So um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is economic volatility, which is something that we're all uh, experiencing now and that certainly for the last 20 years, uh, we've had quite a lot of. Um, and in the ancient world, particularly the Roman world, um, I suspect was by pre-modern standards, a pretty volatile economic space. So that working people, um, one of the many things they had to cope with was this kind of volatility of um, being able to sell your agricultural surpluses on a market one year, and then the bottom drops out of the prices. So if you have any farmers listening, they'll know all about this. Um, and, and now suddenly they, they have no money at all. Um, and uh, farming was prone to this. I think all the other kinds of things that people did to make a living were even more prone to this. So making pottery, making glass, working with iron, craft industries were probably particularly volatile, at least from what we can tell archaeologically. Um, and as 
I suggest that that kind of work form part of a portfolio of things that people did to get by. If that portfolio is volatile, um, a you got a lot to have a lot more egg, a lot of more things in your portfolio uh, in order to compensate for things that work one year and a, ca a catastrophe the next. Um, and uh, I think overall, there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot more uh, raising of fortunes and lowering of fortunes, um, and that's not easy to get at. But um, I think some of the evidence that we have suggests that this is this is particularly true in certain parts of the Roman Empire, and that's another thing I'm interested in: places that are harder or more volatile to live in than others. Yeah, and what you said about the poets is also very important because there's also the problem of perception versus reality uh, or or misperception. That is that, you know, people will very often present themselves as belonging to the sort of morally high ground category, whether it's, you know, wherever it is on the spectrum, in the same way that many Americans believe that they're middle class to the point where it's like almost everybody can claim that status because it has a kind of moral valence that you want to associate with. Uh, so just for the record, in, in I was kind of looking at some numbers in preparation for this. And in if you look at indexes of like American wealth or income, like I looked up my income, I am not in the 90%. I am not. I'm in the 10 Like it was shocking. Right. Now, there's income, there's wealth, there's all kinds of different ways of measuring it. But in just in terms of income and salary, I, like, I'm not in the 90%. So there you go. Um, but it's interesting. Congratulations. That, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I assume it's truer for, you know, more people that, that we know in our circles. Um, but uh, yeah, like the same way that the poets are presenting themselves as sort of struggling and, and all of this. Uh, the ter exactly the terms of poverty and so forth that you mentioned are often used by senators. Like I'm poor, I'm struggling. And you know, you're, you're totally in the top 1%. But anyway, okay. So why is it difficult for ancient historians to study the 90%? And, and why is it so important that we do so? Like marshalling all of the techniques that, that we can like, like you're doing. Um, so why is it hard? Uh, that's an easy one, because these are mostly people who didn't write literature, and I'm specifying literature because I'm going to come back to the kinds of things they do write. Mm. Um, they don't write literature, and uh, therefore, uh, if we write history through um, the people who wrote things down in systematic, big, sexy narratives, they don't write those, and um, so they're they're left out of those narratives. They're left out of those narratives because the rich guys, all guys who wrote those histories, uh, pick your favorite one, Cicero, Livy, Thucydides, if you want to go back farther, um, are not interested in those people. Um, they're just interested in different things, right? And above all, they're interested in the in the state and, and the history of the state and the correct form of the state. Um, and uh, the 90% don't form part of those narratives in the same way that they do today. And that's one of the big differences uh, mm -hmm. about the ancient world and the modern one is um, a disinterest, if not disdain, for working people. Um, I thought a lot about whether when Cicero says things like, you know, the wages of the laborer are the badges of slavery. Does mm -hmm. he really mean this? I mean, Cicero, right, is a guy who did actually come from working stock uh, mm. way back, right? Um, not so far from where I am right now in Italy, actually. <laughs> um, and uh, lots of ancient authors say these things. Um, to what extent are these philosophical positions? Uh, and I think a lot of it actually is a philosophical position, which can be traced back to actually Plato. Um, and we don't have to talk about that. Um, are they operative in any way? They're operative in the sense that those people simply don't form part of those writings. So how in the world do we find them? Um, we have to radically change the, the kind of sources that we do history with. I am an archaeologist by training. And um, while I think, you know, maybe 50 years ago, we might have thought, well, these people didn't leave any archaeological traces. This is patently not true. Uh, you know, probably... 
80% of Pompeii are the traces of these people, if you like, if you want to think of the mm. ancient city of Pompeii, uh, which is the city that we have the most evidence for. And the archaeology of the countryside is almost exclusively the archaeology of, um, of smallholders, right, of small uh, farmers. Sorry, the farmers themselves are not small. <laughs> Their holdings are small. <laughs> Um, so there's a lot of archaeology of these people and there's writing. So to get back to what I said before about the fact that they do write, um, I've been really interested in looking at alternative kinds of writing, um, numeracy. So numbers that people write, um, you don't have to be literate to use numbers and, um, from tallies that, uh, people kept as they were counting things to quantities that are sketched on the top of containers like amphora, um, to lists of expenses, um, to uh, receipts that are scratched on pieces of pottery called ostraca. These are all the writings of the 90%. Um, we even, you know, we have a lot of, as an aside, not economic writing, we have a lot of writing from Pompeii, which is uh, insult. Uh, I just had an undergraduate write his senior thesis on insulting graffiti from Pompeii. It was fantastic. I hope, I don't know how he went back to his parents at winter break and told them what he was working on because it was just, you know, the most extraordinarily rude yeah. things you could ever say to anyone. Some of which are inscribed in verse. <laughs> yes, inventive. Um, yeah, it's really, uh, some of them are actually riffs on Virgil, um, badly mm. spelled, uh, Anyway, so so this is what um, a colleague of ours, uh, Roger Bagnell, has called everyday writing, the kinds of writing that people do who may not be literarily literate, but exist somewhere on a spectrum of literacy. And that writing, uh, particularly the accounting that people do, um, is incredibly valuable to reconstruct their economic lives. We can see them keeping track of their expenses we can see them making loans um, and taking out loans to their neighbors. Um, we can see them um, making uh, contracts of different kinds for tiny, tiny sums of money, which is amazing to think that they're actually using the Roman, a Roman legal system of contract law, right? To, to buy an eighth of a donkey. You have to wonder what happened to the other seven eighths. <laughs> Well, I mean, it, it, it's easier to buy the whole donkey than an eighth of a donkey. <laughs> that requires some sophistication. Donkeys are expensive and you frequently share them. And so <laughs> you want to have a piece of, this is yeah. papyrus in this case. It's or a timeshare. <laughs> exactly. It is, it's a timeshare. Yeah. Anyway, so that's the kind of writing uh, that I look at. So to I was going to ask you this people. later on, once we've talked about some of these um uh, you know, write the writings of everyday life. Um, but I, I think it's more appropriate here. And this is a kind of methodological challenge, uh, which is that, so if the population of the Roman Empire is to roughly about 60 million, and if it takes eight, roughly eight people working the land to support one or two people who don't, just in terms of the, the uh, productivity of agricultural work, and that means that that one to two, that, that 10 to 20 percent are presumably going to be most of the people living in cities. Um, so one could argue that anyone from whom you have any kind of written evidence is by definition part of the 10 percent or close to it. Do, do, do you know what I mean? Like. Um, Anyway, I mean, we can do some rough estimates for this for the size of the urban population of the empire, um, and I've tried to do that. And it includes so the top ten percent would include a great range of wealth. So from the tiny, tiny, tiny uh, groups of you know, like senators and town councilors who would be the most wealthy people, those that's less than one percent. Um, so the other nine percent might be these kinds of literate or sort of literate classes you're describing. And, and so they wouldn't fall into the 90%. So how do you respond to that? Um, so I'm responding on the basis of work not done by myself, um, but on, so, okay. There's two ways of answering this question. 
are we making our 10 to 90 um, on the basis of living in cities versus living in the country, right? Which is not necessarily an economic distinction, right? right? Um, or are we making our 10 versus 90 on the basis of um, those who have to work versus those who don't? Um, and I, I actually think it's useful to do both of those things, right? Okay. So A, obviously, um, our folks who live in cities, let's say for the moment, they're 10%. I actually think it's bigger than that. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, obviously, there's a lot of people who live in cities, if not the majority, right, who are among these working group mm -hmm. of people who have to work with their hands. Um, and it is clear that writing clings to cities, although I was just reading some fascinating work from Roman Britain where they find styluses in farms. <laughs> um, and in a place like Britain, it's a humid climate, you know, anything you wrote is not going to last. Right. Um, but the fact they find styluses in some farms and some roadside stations, um, places they also tend to find weights and coins suggests that writing clings to places of exchange, even in the countryside. Um, the use of writing in the countryside is almost certainly much less than it is in cities. So I completely agree with you there. Um, on the percentage of people who lived in cities, so this is interesting, and there's been some recent work, again, trying to model the urban population versus the rural population, um, and it varies radically. So in Italy, right, I think you could probably say that maybe even upwards of 40 or certainly 30% of people lived in cities because there are gajillions of Roman cities in right. Roman Italy. Um, the same is probably two of uh, parts of Greece and Asia Minor because they have these long, uh, centuries long traditions of really thick carpets of cities. In Gaul, <laughs> you know, there aren't so many cities and in Britain there are even fewer. Um, so, uh, that number varies a lot and there's a, this new work has attempted to quant put some numbers on that and have suggested actually that there's a quite a few more people who lived in cities than we thought. We used to throw out 90, 10, 90% yes. in, in the countryside, 10% in cities, or maybe yeah. 80, 20. Um, I think we might be revising that down even further now, which is, um, I think extremely interesting and certainly goes along with some of the things that I've found. Um, so I hope I did I answer both of your questions. Um, yes, yes. Um, and, about and the writing think, and about the population. Yeah, and it's important to add that there there also used to be this older model according to which the cities were sort of parasitic. They're just sucking up resources from the countryside and living off of the labor of people who live there. Right. But as I mean, many have shown, but your recent work, especially that people in cities do work and they do work with their hands. And, you know, they're not just living off of slave labor in the countryside. Um, and there's a lot of evidence for that. And at the same time, there are people who live in cities who commute out to farms. Yeah, and I think this was more common than is assumed. In other words, a lot of people were doing both things. And I try to get that across and when I'm doing like intro Greek. And we read Lysias' speech, um, uh, uh, the guy who murdered his wife's lover. And apparently his wife was getting together with this guy when he was out at the farm for a day or two, you know, and he'd come back and caught them and killed him. Anyway, yeah, whatever. So it's a classic case. Um, okay, so since we're speaking about older views, let's talk about the, quote, subsistence view that, that's sort of really at, at the heart of the, the methodological move you're trying to make here. So there's this traditional view that economically speaking, most people in the Roman Empire are living at or just slightly above a subsistence level, which is that they're producing just enough that they need to survive, uh, you know, maybe to pay some taxes. And, and that's kind of a model that's used, um, part of which is also the caloric minimum intake. Um, so this is like you calculate, well, what's the minimum number of calories that you need in order to survive and assume, okay, most of the population is living to right around there. Um, so what are the, where is this model coming from and what are its weaknesses? So the model uh, is coming from some very... Um you know, worthy and noble efforts to try to actually put some numbers on uh, consumption and production in the ancient world. And in the absence of any, um, any of the numbers that we might want to use to measure production and consumption at a large scale, um, crop yields, land under cultivation, 
all the 500 variables that go into figuring out how productive is agriculture in the absence of any of those numbers, right? Well, we do know that people needed to eat, let's say, 3,000 calories a day in order to survive, mm. right? And so that then yields a number, right? Um, and then you can fiddle with that number. You can say, okay, plus 10%, right? So it's it, it comes from a place of, of, you know, quite rightly wanting to put, as they say uh, in Italian, to, to give a shape to the water, right? To, to, try to, um, to try to put some, some minima on um, and to put some numbers on, on some of these major economic variables. Um, the problem with it is that, so subsistence itself is a completely um, problematic concept. And even the people who have been, um, you know, sort of advocates of this model that most Roman people lived at subsistence, they recognize this. Nobody can just live on 3000 calories a day. You don't just go out in the world and be like, okay, I'll now, now I'll just somehow produce 3000 calories a day, right? right. You, you constantly have to grow more than that in order to store it for periods when you don't, can't grow anything. Um, so if we're talking about the, you know, say 60 to 70 to even 80 percent of the population who are smallholders, who are, who are small uh, rural farmers, um, the idea is, is that these people are growing just enough to survive. Um, already a problem, right, because it depends on what time of year you're talking about. If you smooth all that, that information out over the course of 365 days, this model suggests they're, they're growing just enough to survive. What's the problem with that is the new archaeology. And if you look everywhere from uh, Roman Britain, where I've been spending a lot of time reading lately, uh, to, uh, to northern Gaul, to um, where I've been working in Tuscany, um, that is to say in the Western part of the empire, um, it's pretty clear that uh, we have so much archeological evidence for uh, smallholders or peasants producing considerable surpluses. How can we see this? Um, we have buildings to hold grain called granaries. Uh, the project I worked on, um, my colleague Manuele Vaccaro discovered what I think is the coolest thing that we ever found, actually, of all the cool things we found. We found these tiny little amphora, little transport containers. They have flat bottoms. That means they're meant to be carried in a cart, not on a ship. And they're small. And they're all local. We're doing some analysis to figure out where they were made. They seem to be made all over the place. Basically, what this is is the residue of a farmer who's got more wine than he knows what than he than he can consume himself, and he's selling it to his neighbors. Mm. Um, and so, those kinds of pieces of evidence are the evidence of surplus production. Harder to find, but also super interesting now is the evidence for um, large scale animal production, particularly cattle in the north um, and um, probably more pigs and cattle in the south, um, in which uh, it's really clear that uh, people are raising large quantities, uh, and sorry, and, um, and sheep in Gaul. Gaul turns out to be the, the sort of Manchester of the Roman world. This is where cloth is made. Uh, and they have loads and loads of sheep uh, that they seem to be herding in these big sort of herding um, sort of complexes. It's hard to know what to, they're, I guess they're kind of like ranches, mm -hmm. um, not so big. Um, and uh, um, Jin Yu Lu has done all this amazing work on the inscriptions of uh, clubs of um, textile dealers, the guys who help uh, move it around, the folks who are wholesalers, the folks who are being the midi the middlemen between the um, people who, it, who are engaged in different parts of the weaving process and people who are buying stuff in small scale or in large scale. Anyway, that's just one example of a surplus economy of um, wool production in Gaul. So it's really only, I think, within the last, I don't know, 30, 20 years that we've been able to see this. And so the, the, the model is, turns out to be wrong just because we have new information, which is exciting. But the model, you seem to be suggesting that the model was devised to set a kind of threshold minimum for the uh, productive sort of capabilities of this part of the population of, of the Roman Empire, not a maximum or uh, the norm, right? Like it has to be at least this much. Um, but over time, 
or even from the start, this model seems to have been used. Uh, that this is pretty much where they live. Because when I encounter the subsistence model, it is asserted as a fact, N not as a at least sort of a kind of minimum. Um, and so I, I don't know if that transition happened over time or, or was part of the model from the start. But there, there seems to me to be a, a, a you know, many ancient historians who, who kind of want it to be like that. Um, anyway, there's a kind of politics about this. We, we can talk about it later if we have time. But um, I, I wanted to, I wanted you to talk more about your model um, in the sense that, as opposed to, you know, uh, devising a kind of, uh, you know, minimum of, you know, calories or whatever, and just kind of assuming that the population lives around there, you're trying to build up a model from the ground up um, and you use the language of praxis uh, to describe this. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about how that would work? So what sorts of things are you looking at from the bottom up uh, to produce a new model? Um, so praxis is for me like what people do to survive. Um, and if we're talking as we have been about agricultural production, um, this is the hardest part to put a number on. Um, but if we're asking about what people do, right, what we're interested in is rather than saying, I'm just going to assume that these people are producing just enough to survive. You flip that question on its head and say, what are people actually doing? To what are survive? they actually producing? Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, and so through archaeology, I can see them doing you know, a whole range of activities, um, putting a number on those activities and saying, okay, we have a family of X number of people who are, per, you know, working Y amount of land for Z amount, different kinds of crops, plus animals, plus the other things that they're doing. Um, how can we uh, then model, right, what that looks like as an income? That part is tough. Um, and um, putting a number on production is really hard. Um, so that tends to be, for me any more way, a more qualitative assessment of the kinds of things that people are doing to survive and a sense that we have that they're producing surpluses, that is to say more than just what you need to save in a, for a bad year, but surpluses that they're selling on some kind of a market. And we have lots of evidence of the kind I just told you, like granaries and amphora and all these other things that they are actually producing things and selling them on um, certain kinds of markets. Um, if we want to ask about consumption, we're considerably better informed. And that's easier to put some numbers on because we have, as I said, lots of lists of expenses. Not lots, but we have quite a few. Um, and so rather than saying, I'm just going to assume that people are consuming a caloric minimum, ask, well, look, what are, what are they actually consuming? And how much is that in calories and how much is that in money? Um, and uh, so I just published an article where I use some graffiti from Pompeii to look at both of those questions, the, the, the what in or the how much in terms of calories and money, but then the, also the how, how are people consuming? If they're not just, you know, easing their crust of bread in order to survive, what in the world are they doing? Well, the answer is from what's happening in Pompeii and um, I'm 99% sure these are working people. They're certainly not rich people who are scratching their daily expense accounts on the walls. Um, they have really interesting uh, ways that they consume. They eat a lot of meat which we never thought that was true. The, the subsistence model is really based on a grain majority diet um, with a bare, almost no meat and um, a certain amount of things like uh, olive oil and wine. Um, they are eating a lot of olive oil and they're drinking a ton of wine, um, which has a lot of calories <laughs> for any of your listeners who've ever tried to cut alcohol out of their diet, they will know how many calories it consumes. Yeah. Um, so if you look at these lists of expense lists of people, they are consuming differently and to a much um, higher degree of both calories and money uh, than certainly we would have ever assumed. Um, the question that I'm now thinking about is what does that look like in the countryside? 
Um, so I can tell you with reasonable certainty that uh, smallholders and peasants in the countryside are producing a surplus, but what are they consuming themselves, right? Um, and you mentioned a minute ago this idea, this old idea that um, we used to think cities were sort of parasitical in the countryside. And mm -hmm. um, you imagined all these poor rural farmers producing and sending off all of their crops to the city where it would all be, you know, gobbled up by rich people. This is the so-called consumer city model. Um, one of the things I've gotten really interested in is what amazing consumers the people in the countryside are. Peasants in the countryside, Roman peasants are consumers of everything. And those of us who've excavated rural farmsteads all over the, certainly the Western empire, are am continually amazed by how much stuff these people have, right? They have an amazing range of ceramics in where I excavate in Italy. They have glass, even in their pigsties. Um, they're using coins. Uh, the, the rural consumer turns out to be uh, a pretty amazing economic force. Um, we never imagined rural people as big consumers because according to the subsistence model, right? These are people who just got enough to make it and they're not gonna go buy things if they can grow them or produce them themselves. When in fact, what we see is they're producing actually an astonishingly little of what they need themselves and buying a lot more than what we assumed. Um, so uh, all of that together, I think, produces a completely different, as you see, um, but, and by bottom up, right? What are people actually doing? Well, what they're actually doing doesn't bear much resemblance to the subsistence model. Yeah, I was just thinking um, as you were saying this, that what you need is a good classical source that describes this um, as you're describing it, you know, from the archeological side, because, you know, there's nothing more powerful than an ancient source that encapsulates some kind of idea, you know, very nicely. And there's this passage of Galen that I know that's been used again and again and again for the parasitical city model. It, there's this passage where he says, so this is Galen, the ancient medical writer, you know, writing around 200, uh, where he says that either there is some famine or scarcity or something, and the people in the cities just sucked up all of the agricultural production from the countryside, and you could go and see the people in the field dying from hunger and all of this. And it's just, it's just so perfect if you want to assert that model. But it's just one source, and you know, it's rhetorical and it's all kinds of things. But that's this is how the classical sources are, you know, deployed as they like to shut down all further argument. I mean, I remember this text coming up again and again in the readings that I did as a student. Um, anyway. So, but Anthony, can I just, can yeah. I just, so if you had such a source that described, uh, you know, in, I don't know, iambic pentameter, <laughs> uh, 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 a Roman peasant, um, you know, producing surpluses and selling them on the market, yeah. would that be somehow more believable than what I just told you? It would be, oh, um, it, I hate to say this, but in a certain sense, yes, um, it, it would it would work rhetorically. I mean, we don't want it to work that way. We'd rather that people were convinced by, you know, <laughs> mounds of archaeological evidence <laughs> rather than a poem by Marshall. <laughs> but, you know, I think rhetorically, it makes a difference if you can just, you know, pop that. Um, anyway, um, I'm sure they exist. It's just that they just weren't selected for recycling the way that passage by Galen and others you know, were. Um, also, your model is proposing a much more um, sort of flexible and diverse um, set of activities for um, these I use the term peasants now, we'll come back to that later. But you're suggesting that their praxis was on a day-to-day -day level much more complex than one would normally think, right? And, uh, you know, modern scholars who are by definition not you know, agricultural workers sort of see peasants and they think these people are engaged in a simple set of activities. Uh, difficult though they may be, um, but not necessarily this complex world that you're describing. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about that, the, the, the strategies of getting by that are yeah. not just, you know, use the hoe, sow the seed, reap it, thresh it, and then so forth. 
Right. Um, so before I do that, I, I've been watching this um, series, Clarkson's Farm. I don't know if you know this, Jeremy mm. Clarkson, TV presenter known for driving fast cars around, bought this farm in Oxfordshire and has been attempting to be a farmer. And it's fantastic because here you have on display, the total ignorant of modern city person about what it actually takes to make the land grow. Now, this is a large farm, right? And he has a combine harvester and um, many tractors, certainly not the Roman smallholder. But the level of ignorance <laughs> um, mm. is, I think, always as he encounters all the different things that you have to do to make farm work, um, I'm constantly reminded about how we as scholars who are mostly not farmers, um, Victor Davis Hansen, Greek famously. historian, yes. <laughs> famously a farmer, um, how little we know about farming. So um, one of the things that the new archaeology is, has been making clear every year, I think, is that um, all kinds of activities went on in the countryside, in the Roman world particularly. Why in the Roman world particularly? Because the Roman world undergoes something of what I call a consumer revolution. People consume more and more stuff, consumer goods, and also different kinds of foods. But the consumer goods are largely made in the countryside in small scale, little rural industries, pottery, above all, uh, bricks, tiles, iron working um, in certain areas. I've been looking at salt making. Anyway, these are all what we would call part of the non-agricultural economy. But who does all those jobs? The same people who are working in the countryside anyway. Most of these jobs, uh, which tend to be new, for the in the Roman period, um, are things that you can fit in alongside the many tasks that have to be carried out to grow grain uh, in the Mediterranean, grapes and olives and everything else that you're trying to grow. Um, and uh, most of those um, those little industries are seasonal; they're not full time occupations for anybody. And so while we've always thought of things like ceramic making as a craft that involves separate, special, distinct craft people, potters, that's only a tiny portion of what it takes to make pots, right? You have to have someone dig the clay. You have to have someone to pry and chop down the wood for the fuel. You have to have someone who hauls the water. You have to have someone who runs these big uh, sifting tanks to clean the clay, la, 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 right? A gajillion different tasks have to take place, most of which are unskilled most of which would have been done by local people. There's no other way that those tasks could get done. Those are jobs for children. Those are jobs for um, extra family members, men or women who aren't doing whatever particular agricultural task has to be done on their farms at the time. Um, so this is, okay, can I be 110% sure that the people from farm X worked in pottery factory Y? No. Um, it's a logical deduction in a general sense without being able to you know, say these specific people did these specific activities in addition to farming. Um, but it's pretty clear uh, that they must have done. Um, and then you would have had some specific craftsmen who were probably itinerant like potters um, and particular you know, specialists in iron, et cetera, who may have moved around or uh, it's been suggested also just lived on these farms, but they just happened to be good at some other specific thing. Um, so that forms what I call the portfolio of activities that uh, particularly rural people carry out um, so that the idea of, of a peasant as a purely agriculturalist, um, I think is in, not uniquely in the Roman period, but particularly in the Roman period, um, is probably wrong. And in fact, they are doing this whole set of other activities because of this new demand for consumer goods. And in the towns where we can track some of these things more, you have also found evidence for, you know, sort of complex lending relationships and monetization and the contracts that you mentioned and coping with the fluctuations of risk. Can you talk a little bit about those kinds of activities? Yeah, I haven't worked on them quite as much. Um, and they are super interesting. So let's talk about lending. Um, the evidence that we have, which is graffiti from the Vesuvian cities from Pompeii and Herculaneum, and then we have a ton of papyri from Egypt, and we have these ostraca also from Egypt. They find everybody lending and borrowing money at tiny scales. 
Now, when we've talked about lending and borrowing in the um, in the ancient world, that is to say, the credit um, the creditary world, we've almost entirely talked about very wealthy people yeah. who are um, using credit largely for um, for trade, right? In order to stock a ship with mm -hmm. uh, you know however many tons of wine, you need to borrow money and you need to be able to move money around with, without actually moving coins around, right? So that's what we've talked about so far. But actually, if you dig into the corpus of papyri, you find lots of transactions which are pretty small. Um, they seem to be, for instance, um, a wonderful example from Egypt of uh, a sheep farmer who is borrowing some money. It's clearly a bridge loan because his sheep haven't been sheared yet. And he has to pay either rent or taxes or something that's coming due before he's sheared his sheep. And so it's a bridge loan for about a month or two um, in order, which is actually pretty substantial. Uh, and he's using his sheep as collateral um, in order to get him by this period of not actually having ready cash, right? Um, and in fact, it, we, that same guy, even at one point, um, he, he actually sells the future wool on his sheep. It's like sheep futures. A futures market. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so these are, but the thing about these, if you like financial transactions is that they're small in scale. And so we haven't been terribly interested in them. Um, and, but they're nonetheless fairly, I'm not gonna say complex, but they do involve a level of um, financial thinking, um, which in, sees people taking risks which is another thing that these people are not supposed to do, right? Along with the subsistence model mm. is the is the risk aversion model, right? People don't take risks. Mm. Well, borrowing money is a risk. Um, and there's a lot of modern psychological studies done by behavioral economists today that says people would always rather just pay for something than take a loan um, in, a, in a kind of everyday transactions because we have this kind of inherent sort of yeah. concern culturally that you know borrowing money is somehow risky. We see these people doing it all the time. Um, they they take out money on the women on the basis of their dowry. They use their dowry as collateral. Um, so all kinds of, of financial transactions, mostly at small scale, mostly um, for short periods of time, and which tend to, as I said, be these sort of bridge, bridge loans. Um, why do they need bridge loans? Because their economic, uh, economic lives are pretty um, volatile. Uh, right, they're going up and down. And so um, you frequently have low points of low ebb that you have to cover somehow. It also yeah. suggests though, right, there's a lot of, even if money isn't changing hands, there's creditary money, right? There's paper, there's um, yes. script money, right? That's moving around. And that's another thing that we never imagined, you know, uh, working people engaged in, um, in sort of money accounting that, didn't involve actual coins. Yeah, I have found some evidence for this kind of uh, this is what we might call complex financial instruments um, in some of the later Egyptian papyri, uh, where you have the the like IOUs that are basically traded used as money, the pitakion, right? Which, yep. Yeah, um, and also for kind of speculating in gold prices, like you you can see that they're like there are letters that say, hey, in the neighboring town, the price of gold is slightly whatever, lower. Go buy it all there and then bring it right. here. So like stuff like that. And uh, yeah, for small sums. For small You're going to have to share that stuff with me. That's like 7th and 8th century, right? That's super interesting. No, no. Um, certainly 5th and 6th mostly, but which is where we have the majority of the papyri. Yeah. No, there's some good 7th and 8th century stuff around this too. Yeah. And... And then, as I'm speaking as a Byzantinist, there's this gap because we lose Egypt and we don't yeah. have that kind of evidence. Yeah. And then it starts again in the later Byzantine period when we start having much more detailed financial documents from the monasteries and their endowments. So from you know, mostly the 12th century afterwards, and you see yeah. the same stuff, it's all there. And you see, um, actually, I'm um, going to speak with uh, Fotini Kondili, uh, whose book published her book on a lot of this uh, from the archaeological side uh, also, but she uses some of these documents like 14th century Limnos. Right. 
where there are, you know, these very, you know, and you probably call them poor and peasants and so forth on Limnos, but th they're involved in these very complicated financial relationships where they're owning, like the timeshares we mentioned, they're owning part of a house. Right. And they have, they, they have to keep records of just what fractions of things they own. And, and this involves some math when you're paying taxes. Like it's, anyway, it's, uh, Actually, I think she and I discussed it a little bit in a previous podcast uh, where we did the, yes, yes, it was one of the, who, who would you like to meet an interview? And she spoke about this woman from early 14th century Limnos who we have her basically, you know, census record. Anyway, yeah, yeah, it's good stuff. Um, so um, I mentioned that there is a sort of controversy or that, that you feel conflicted about the use of the term peasant I don't know if you want to discuss that now, but it, it would be useful for our audience at least to have a kind of general statement from you about what the pros and cons of the term are. Yeah, I mean, we started out this podcast actually talking about language and what do we call people mm. who, um, in the words of Eric Wolf, um, the anthropologist, have been written out of history. And so we don't have good words for them. We don't mm. have their own words and our own modern words don't work very well. Peasant is a case in point. So, um, right, the modern word peasant is a kind of, it, it, it has an interesting etymology, which I'm not gonna get into, um, which is um, certainly has roots in the Roman world, um, but where it really uh, comes into its, current usage is in the Middle Ages. And so it carries this medieval baggage around with it. Um, if you think of a peasant, you probably imagine that character oh. from Monty Python, yes. Holy Grail, help, help, I'm being repressed, right? Now we yes. see the violence inherent in the system. Yes, yes. Right? Um, and when I talk about peasants, I always show that clip. Um, so that's a problem because that term peasant Either it is carries around this medieval baggage or increasingly because of um, a lot of anthropological work on peasants, um, it has come to be a category which is ahistorical. It imagines a group of people who are unchanging because they work the land and the land doesn't change, they don't change, right, in a nutshell. And since farming is just farming and it never changes and you know you always need seeds and you always need precipitation, you always need soil, what's to change? Therefore, the people don't change. Um, this is a, a very rough sketch of, of um, not just the word peasant, but the, um, the scholarly baggage that it's, it, it came to have. Um, and then a, a bunch of smart people, including Eric Wolf said, wait a minute, these people are not timeless people. They're involved in, um, they're above all involved in, he was mostly working in the modern world, in globalization, right? So peasants in Guatemala and peasants in Africa and peasants in, um, you know, uh, in the Arctic Circle. These are people who are not outside of the economic forces of the world. Either they're moved around by them or they push back at them, but they're engaged in, uh, in a global world. And so at one point, I I felt like we got over that and peasant became rehabilitated. We didn't have to imagine a timeless category or a person uh, in the Middle Ages that we could actually imagine simply someone who lived in the countryside, right? Um, and worked the land and engaged with whatever economy they lived in, right? And helped shape it, in my case, the Roman world. I become more and more pessimistic about this not least because whenever I talk about peasants, I can still see people thinking about all those things in the back of their head, mm. particularly the timeless thing and particularly the agriculture thing. As we learn more and more about the portfolio of other activities that Roman smallholders, my current favorite term, did like potting and ironworking and all these other things, right? It's the agricultural baggage of the term that started to worry me the most. Um, there's a ton of work on how peasants in all kinds of different periods were never just agriculturalists. It's not just Roman ones. Um, but it's hard to get that out of your head, right? You think of a peasant, you think of a farmer. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, that's 
that's in an, one example, <laughs> Anthony, of the, the million problems of language that uh, surround talking about the 90%. Yeah, I don't now remember whether or how often I use the term peasant in the Byzantine history that I wrote. I'm going to have to go and do a word search before it's published <laughs> just to make sure that, you know, I don't ever use it in that kind of context. But in my thinking, uh, peasants in the society that I study are, <laughs> they do some very interesting things. And the one aspect that I am most interested in is the way that they, manipulate the, um, the the mechanisms of the state and the laws in order to you know gain an advantage and so I'm, I'm I'm always interested in looking at the um an apography the sort of the colony so this is like the lowest social rank of farmer in the later Roman Empire uh, where you're kind of bound to the land and you just sort of come one step uh, on, uh, um, above being a slave. And yet, every time Justinian issues a law about them and you know, what their rights are in this court or that court, they took advantage of those laws so fast that within months, Justinian had to issue other novels clarifying, no, I didn't actually mean that. And we're just getting too many people who are doing this. Like, in Egypt, within weeks of every of these novels coming out. Um, and just again and again, they are like colluding with agents of the fisc to give trouble to bishops. So bishops are always complaining about these Yeorgi who are in cahoots with the tax assessor to ruin my bishopric. And it's like, real, like, oh yeah, those are your peasants. Like, yeah, that's what they'll do. <laughs> anyway. Um, oh, good. So, like, we're almost out of time. Actually, this went by faster than I um, than I realized. Um, I would like. So, I, I think I'm going to couple this discussion with um, uh, a discussion with Dan Kaner about giving wealth. Ah, uh, good. Yes. Uh, so, I wanted to kind of set this up for production and consumption, and then giving. Got it. Uh, kind of as a diptych. And so I was wondering if you could just in conclusion, talk a little bit about how Christian writers are, um, you know, adapting the language of rich and poor and, and, you know, how their story kind of interfaces with, with what you've been describing, just almost as a kind of relay handoff to what Dan's going to be talking about a little bit. So what, what's the sort of Christian out outlook on this? Um, so uh, and I'm going to refer everyone to uh, both Dan's great new book um, and Peter Brown's Through the Eye of the Needle, uh, mm -hmm. which really wrestled with the language that Christian thinkers use to create um, a culture of giving and the work they make the categories of rich and poor, which you remember I started out saying I didn't want to use, um, how they make those categories work for the church. Um, so ancient writers, uh, pick your favorite one, everyone always picks Cicero, um, also uses these categories of rich and poor to do certain kinds of work. And so they bifurcate society into rich people and poor people. And for a long time, people were like, you know, I'm not really sure they're talking about actual poor people. These mm -hmm. poor people don't seem to be terribly poor that they're talking about. They seem to have businesses and they, you know, they're, they're selling things and they're doing things. Um, and the same is true in much of the Christian uh, writing. I'll just pick Ambrose because he um, is writing a riff, a kind of extended dance remix on Cicero's De Afficius, <laughs> his own De Afficius, um, yes. in which he's trying to rethink what, it, what the, the proper Christian society should look like. And he does a lot of work with the terms rich and poor, right? And basically he imagines a kind of giving machine in which wealth flows from one, the rich people, and it flows to the poor. Um, and when you poke poor, as uh, my colleague Crystal Throw has done, the actual words he uses, he's not talking about poor people, right? If anything, he's kind of talking about the plebs, right? He's talking about people, the people. Um, mm. 
because he's not actually trying to describe actual people, right? He's trying to create a kind of um, uh, an abstracted framework of how a Christian society should work. What I've been really interested in is, okay, fine, you have all these people and, okay, Deificius is not a sermon necessarily, um, but we have lots of sermons, right, in which you've got a Christian bishop and standing up in front of these congregants, whom I can tell you, right, because the world that I'm painting for the Roman period certainly persists through the fourth and maybe parts of the fifth century, is composed of all these people doing all this busy stuff, right? They're selling things, they're buying things, they're lending things. They don't fit in these rich poor categories, right? What in the world are they thinking? listening to themselves right. categorized like this. Um, and John Chrysostom is a good one, right? Sure. He lives in two cities that are full of people doing tons of different kinds of stuff, working people who, because he's either in Antioch or in Constantinople, they're capitals, they have huge amounts of commercial activity. Um, and uh, there's lots of different kinds of people in their audiences. And yet he continues to use this bifurcated language of rich and poor, it's kind of hilarious. But what he does, right, is he embeds a Christian meaning to those activities, particularly to buying, selling, and lending. It, he talks about his sermon as a loan, right, that will be paid back by mm. the people listening to it. Mm. Um, he constantly uses a numeric language. Um, uh, what... Uh, a uh, colleague uh, who does New Testament studies, Jennifer Quigley calls theoeconomics, right? So he embeds <laughs> his, his sermons with economic thinking. Mm -hmm. And so even though he's dicing everyone up into rich and poor, which has no bearing on who the people are actually listening to him, right? Um, he's speaking to them in a language they know. Um, and, and if you, I haven't actually done this, but the, if you tracked this sort of use of economic language to do rhetorical work, there has to be a kind of apogee of it in, you know, the fourth, fifth and sixth century sermons, um, almost certainly because those are, those are the people they're addressing, right? They're addressing yeah. people who are embedded in complex economic environments. Um, and I just think that's kind of amazing, right? I mean, look, you don't have to go too far in the Bible uh, to find that kind of language. And New Testament scholars have done a lot of work on um, New Testament economic thinking. Um, but it really goes to town in these late antique sermons. Super great. Yes, that's an excellent point to you're imagining the audience of a sermon. And they're hearing about all the rich and the poor. Which of the two do they think they are? Well, they're meant to be the poor. Yes. And if I were sitting there, I'd be pissed, right? Like, what are you telling me? I'm per perfectly, you know, well-off shoemaker. Yes. What's up with this rich poor What's up with this, yes. <laughs> and again, just a, a caution to our audience today. Like, when you see that article about, you know, the middle class under threat, <laughs> and, and this happens to me, like, again, just a confession. Like, I read this, I get all worked up, and I'm like, oh, the poor middle class. Like, like we're the middle class, and then I I read the article. And wait, no, that that's not me. That's not describing me. Yeah. Like I want to identify with this cause, sort of ideologically, but no, mm -hmm. they're not describing me. Um, I I shouldn't pretend like I'm in that situation. Uh, so anyway. Anthony, what what what's incumbent on us, right, as historians? You asked why it's so important to study these people. Yeah. Well, I mean, the easy answer is they're the great majority of the population, and we've largely ignored them, right? <laughs> in a nutshell, but actually getting at, what do we mean by the middle class? What are the actual activities, right? That make you, not just your income, right? That, and and um, the things that you can do and you can't do, um, the uh, your ability to save. Um, in other words, the these categories ought to ask us to open them up, right? And you open them up by asking, what do people do? by yeah. asking about praxis. Um, in other words, exploding a category, which is really a category of analysis, the middle class, what does that actually mean for my daily life? Nothing. I live my life by doing economic things. What kinds of things do I do, right? Those are categories of praxis. And it's those categories of praxis where I think um, we as historians, insofar as we can leverage all this new evidence to do it, are really obliged 
uh, to to examine. Yes, <laughs> you're exactly right. And and this focus on praxis really helped me clarify my thinking about this, which was kind of submerged. But for example, and tell me if this counts as an example of praxis. <laughs> When I'm talking to my guy at Morgan Stanley <laughs> to help me make a move from one house to another, <laughs> right? That's kind of a praxis, right? But I don't think it's your average middle class praxis. And you can do that because you have capital, right? And that. Well, I did. <laughs> All right. Well, we were talking about boom bust economics. Yes. No. Well, now you have a house, right? You have a more expensive house. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, anyway, that's Perfect. that. Yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes, thank you, Kim. Thank you so much for this. I, I was fascinated to explore your writing. I'm going to keep reading. I, I, I've made a, a read list here, and thank you for coming on to the podcast too. It's been such a pleasure to talk to you, Anthony, as always. All right, take care.